Hi, I'm uh, Leela Farmer. I'm a data analyst working for the NHS in North Devon. And I wanted to share with you a recent analysis project that I've been working on. Um, and it looks at the frequency of methotrexate monitoring. So the aim of this talk is really to demonstrate how we have used Python for data analysis, uh, just using this particular methotrexate study as an example. Um, now, to give you some brief context, I've been working in the pathology department in North Devon for just over three years. I've been working on various ad hoc analysis projects. Um, the, the main data set that I work with is laboratory test data. And it's a, it's a massive data set and it contains all patients lab test results carried out in North Devon. It's exported at the end of every month with each month con containing many hundreds of thousands of rows of data and it's stored as CSV files. Now this massive data set is obviously a fantastic resource. It really has the potential to to really help inform intelligent decision making about many aspects of healthcare. And before I started working there, people were using Excel to analyze it and they were using some really clever and really complex visual basic code. But ultimately, Excel is really limited in what it can do. It can barely open up one month of this lab test data, and that takes about five minutes. Now, this is a Python group, so I'm sure you already all understand the vast benefits of, of Python. And for us, using, using Python has really opened up the possibilities to enable us to analyze this data in so many different ways. So these are the, the tools that I tend to use. All of my coding is done in Jupyter Notebooks. Um, I use pandas for working with the data frames and mostly use Plotly for doing the graphs. So these are all freely available tools. They're not particularly complex. They're all totally accessible. And yet with these tools, there's so much that we can do with the data. So this project, which I'll just show you, is just one example. Uh, the results of which have just been presented by Natasha Wood at the British Rheumatology Conference in April. So I'm going to show you some of her slides, uh, but focusing mainly on the data and the Python aspects of the project. And initially I was a bit hesitant about presenting this because it's not a hugely complex use of Python. There's no machine learning or AI or anything clever, but actually that, that's probably the main point of my talk. This analysis is straightforward because I'm using Python. None of this would have been practical or even possible in Excel. So this particular project came about from a request by Stuart Kyle, who's a consultant rheumatologist in North Devon. And he asked us to investigate the frequency of routine blood tests for patients on methotrexate. And as you'll see, the project led to a much better understanding of the current situation regarding methotrexate monitoring and strong evidence to change the current testing guidelines. So just to give you some background on this project, methotrexate, which you'll see abbreviated here as MTX, um, is given for a number of conditions. Patients can be on the medication for many years and so regular monitoring is required to detect any potential adverse drug responses. The British Society for Rheumatology advised that monitoring bloods should include a number of tests. And these are the main, the six main ones that we focused on for this study. Now, obviously patients have blood tests for a number of different reasons, but those blood tests that are specifically for routine methotrexate monitoring can be identified by the string star DMARD in the clinical notes. So previously, the UK guidance recommended that stable methotrexate patients, so those are patients who have been on methotrexate for over a year, uh, they should be mo monitored monthly. But then this change, this recommendation changed to three monthly in 2015. But then with the onset of COVID and the restrictions due to the pandemic, the Devon CCG approved a change to the local shared care guidelines, reducing the frequency to six monthly testing 
in patients who are stable on methotrexate. Now, this provided a great opportunity for a data analysis. It's a, a natural experiment where many patients reduced their frequency of testing all at the same time. And this gave us a unique chance to investigate whether this reduced frequency of testing was safe or if it had caused any harm to patients. Because if it could be shown that reduced frequency caused no harm, then this would provide a strong argument for continuing with reduced frequency testing after the pandemic, or even moving to patient initiated testing. So we started by searching our database for all tests since 2017. So this is just over 33 million tests, um, just over 160,000 patients. We then analysed the clinical notes field to identify all patients on methotrexate, but without any other additional DMARDs. And this was then further filtered to only include those who'd been on the medication for at least a year. And this resulted in a list of 854 patients in North Devon who were on methotrexate for at least 12 months before April 2018 and who continued on methotrexate between then and April 2021. And this group formed the basis of the analysis. So with this group of 854 patients, we started with basic exploratory analysis. We just looked at the average number of days between tests for each patient. And here we plotted the range and looked at how this changed with, with time. So the graph shows that there's a big change that occurred in April 2020. And this is consistent with the start of pandemic restrictions. So from this, we decided to look at the frequency of testing from the year before and then the year after this date. So interestingly, despite the guidance before the pandemic being for three monthly testing, you can see from this that actually the majority of patients, so over 50% of the patients were being tested monthly. So that's three times as many tests as is recommended. And then when the guidance changed to six monthly testing during the pandemic restrictions, the patients actually moved to three monthly testing. So we decided to look more closely at a group of 229 patients um, who we found had moved from monthly to three monthly testing. And we, first, we refer to this group as subgroup one. So the next step then was to investigate these particular patients to see if they had come to any harm as a result of the reduced frequency of testing. But how could we test, um, how could we tell if there'd been any harm? So we looked at this in three different ways, by comparing for higher and for reduced frequency of testing. First of all, the overall distribution of test results for each analyte. Secondly, the worst test results for each individual patient for each analyte. And thirdly, the incidence of catastrophic test results. So firstly, looking at the overall distribution. So here you've got six graphs. Each graph is a different analyte. And the pale orange shaded areas on each one represent what's considered abnormal using the rheumatology guidelines. And for each analyte, the higher frequency year is in light grey and the lower frequency is in dark blue. And e each point in the, the jitter plot represents an individual test result from a monitoring test. So you can see the distributions from all of the results uh, with their corresponding box plots and then can visually compare the different years. So you can see that for each analyte, the distributions are actually very similar. We also calculated confidence intervals on the differences between the distributions. And this was again done in Python, just using a couple of lines of code. And from this, we concluded that there's no evidence for significant difference in distributions for the two different testing regimes. Next, we looked at individual patient differences. So for each patient, we found the highest of each of their ALT and MCV results and the lowest of all the other test results seen in routine monitoring tests 
during the higher frequency testing year. So in each case, this is the closest result to being abnormal, or in other words, it's their worst result for each analyte for each patient. And again, the light gray is the higher frequency year. And here in the jitter plot, each point represents a single patient's worst result for that year. We then found the worst result for each patient for the lower frequency testing year as well. And uh, visually, you can see that the distributions are very similar again, and that the worst results in the lower frequency year are no closer to the abnormal range than in the higher frequency year. So the differences between the worst results in the two different years were then calculated for each patient and confidence intervals were calculated. The results showed that each patient is no more likely to have an abnormal result with less frequent testing. And then looking at the incidence of catastrophic test results. So to to determine whether the reduced frequency of testing resulted in any extreme abnormal results, the number of catastrophic test results, which is as defined by the Royal College of Pathologists, was calculated for the higher frequency and for the reduced frequency years. Now for these, we looked at any tests, so not just the routine tests, but those carried out in any setting for any reason during the period of study. So obviously included periods of illness, as well as any hospital admissions. And the results showed that catastrophic results were extremely rare and they were no more likely with less frequent testing. They didn't occur during routine monitoring and they only occurred in patients being managed for coexisting um, morbidities. So in summary, the study showed that the overall distribution of results for each analyte is no more likely to be abnormal with less frequent testing. On an individual level, individual patients are no more likely to have an abnormal test result with less frequent testing. And catastrophic results were extremely rare and no more likely with less frequent testing. And then we repeated the whole analysis with patients who moved from about three monthly to five monthly testing. And this was a smaller group of about 120 patients. And again, we found the same results. So in other words, we found no evidence of any harm caused by moving to less frequent testing. However, testing too frequently has been found to be related to increased patient anxiety and depression, as well as obviously impacting clinician workload environmental footprints and obviously financial costs. And just looking at the environmental impact, um, we calculated the distance of each of the patients in the study from their GP. Again, we did this in Python and it's a fairly rural area. So we found that on average, a round trip to the GP take, uh, is just under seven miles. And from this, we calculated that moving from quarterly to annual testing, would save over 17,000 miles each year and just in this patient group. So overall, the conclusions from the um, BSR presentation were, firstly, we saw that there'd been a delay in the uptake of change in primary care. So people were um, being tested much more frequently than was recommended. We saw that less frequent monitoring did not result in patient harm. And this is consistent with other larger studies in the UK. And so the recommendation was to move to less frequent monitoring with safety netting. Now, in reality, this is just a small part of what we've learned about methotrexate monitoring through this analysis project. Um, because we're using Python, we've been able to investigate and understand all sorts of aspects of methotrexate monitoring, leading to much greater understanding. For example, which demographics are most likely to have abnormal test results uh, within the set of tests, which ones are most likely to, to flag as being abnormal, and also how the definition of abnormal in rheumatology compares to gastroenterology and dermatology. Now, again, these are all done in Python, mainly using Plotly, but also using Venn diagrams and upset plots. And we've made, managed to make similar insights into other analysis projects that we've been working on, such as sort of urine infections, 
seasonal potassium fluctuations and many others. And my final slide just shows you some of the key requirements for all of these projects that we've worked on. Firstly, we obviously need the data and this needs to be the full data set. Any sort of anonymization loses valuable data. For example, without the NHS numbers, we wouldn't have been able to calculate the time gap between successive monitoring tests or the distance from each uh, for each patient to their GP. Or we wouldn't have been able to investigate the cause of specific abnormal results. So having the full data set is really key. Secondly, we need Python. Now, it may, might sound really obvious, but I mentioned this here as probably this was the most difficult part. It, it took me six months to persuade the IT department to al allow me to use Python on the NHS computers. And having Python installed on the same computer as the data is essential. We can't export, export the data to another computer due to the size and the confidentiality issues. So actually getting Python on the same machine was key. And thirdly, subject matter expertise. Clearly, it's important to understand what it is that you're analysing. Now, my background is in geophysics, so I have no medical knowledge at all. So I rely heavily on other people for medical input. Um, most of the projects that I work on rely on a great deal of involvement from Tom Lewis, who's a consultant microbiologist here in North Devon. And his involvement is key to inform and to steer the analysis. Having expertise in the area of study is essential for making sure that the analysis is asking the right questions and that the results are meaningful and relevant. And I think that with these three ingredients, there's such a wealth of important and interesting analyses that can be carried out. And so to sum up, the aim of this talk was just to demonstrate how we have used Python in one of our analysis projects. So it uses freely available, not particularly complex tools. It's all totally accessible. And the versatility, the capacity, the, the flexibility of Python has meant that this analysis, although it takes time, is actually fairly straightforward and achievable. And yet it's produced some quite illuminating results with strong evidence of the need for changing the current guidelines. Now, obviously, this is just the first step. How to actually enact those changes is probably the most difficult bit, but hopefully this analysis will, as is the aim of all of our analyses, uh, will provide valuable insights into the data and hopefully enable some intelligent decision making. So thank you. If there's any questions, feel free to let me know. Mm -hmm.